Here's another optimization question, and the difference between this one and some of the other videos you may have watched here uh, would be that in this case we're asked to minimize time. So the situation that's described is there's a person out in the water, they're two miles from the nearest point on a straight shoreline. Uh, they want to get to a house that's six miles further down the shoreline. We know the rate that the person can row at, uh, we know the rate that they can walk at, and what we want to do is we want to find the point on the shoreline where they should land the boat in order to minimize the amount of time that it would take to get from the place where they are out in the water to the house. And so if we go ahead and, and draw a quick diagram here, I'm going to say that this is the shoreline. We'll say that this is the person out in the water. So we know that they are two miles out into the water. Uh, we have a house that's six miles down the shoreline. So this distance would be six miles. And what we want to do is we want to try to figure out uh, where the person should land the boat uh, here, here, driving a straight line from where they are to the house uh, in order to minimize the time that it would take them to get from here to the house. So I'm just going to put a point kind of right smack dab in the middle of the shoreline here and I'm going to say that the person's going to row the boat to that point on the shoreline and then they're going to be able to walk at a little bit faster rate the rest of the way to the house. They're going to have to row this distance and they're going to have to walk this distance. We want to figure out where this point should be between here and here in order to minimize the total amount of time that it's going to take them to get from where they are currently to the house. So what we can go ahead and do here just to kind of get some more distances involved, uh, I'm going to call this value uh, right here x. Okay, it says how far, or it says how far from the house should the person land. So I'm going to call that distance x, how far from the house they land. Uh, if this is x, this distance right here is going to be the full six miles from here to the house minus the x that we've already accounted for uh, from the point the rest of the way to the house. So this distance is going to be six minus x. So if you notice, what we have here is a right triangle with a two mile leg and a six minus x mile leg we can use the Pythagorean theorem to find what the hypotenuse of that is and that's going to be the distance that this person is going to have to row the boat. And so if we go ahead and say well 2 squared plus this quantity squared is going to be equal to this squared, we can find what the hypotenuse is by taking the square root of 2 squared plus this quantity squared. So we have a diagram here, pretty much everything is labeled on the diagram, but what we really need to develop a formula for is we need to develop a formula for time. Uh, so we need a formula for the total time that it's going to take them to get from here to the house. Now one of the nice things that we have going for us in this problem is that they don't have a, a rate of rowing that's changing. They have a constant rate that they're going to row at, and they also have a constant rate that they're going to walk at. And anytime you're dealing with constant rates, or you might call these average rates of change, what you can always use is this formula for middle school that says distance is equal to rate times time. Uh, we can use this to our benefit here because we can figure out a formula for the time that it's going to take them to travel this many miles given the rate that they can row at and another formula for the the time that it's going to take them uh, to walk x miles given the rate that they can walk at so if we use this distance equals rate times time idea to develop our time formula in the water we're going to be able to say that the distance is this square root right so the square root is going to go in place of the distance that's the total distance they need to row uh, that's going to be equal to the rate that they can row, 3 miles per hour, times time. Well, we want a formula for the time that they're going to spend rowing from here to here. Well, that's going to be this distance divided by the rate that they can row at, right? Just solve this distance equals rate times time formula for time. So that's going to end up being that square root. So the square root of 4 plus uh, 6 minus x quantity squared divided by the rate that they can row and they can row at three miles per hour. We're going to add to that the amount of time that they're going to spend walking on land. Uh, the distance they have to walk on land is defined to be x miles. We labeled that in our diagram as x. 
So distance is x. The rate that they can walk is 5 miles per hour. So the time they're going to spend walking is going to be x divided by 5. Right? Time is going to be equal to distance divided by rate. So that's going to be x divided by 5. We have a formula for time here. This formula does only depend on a single variable. The only variable here is x. So now what we want to do is we want to do the, the derivative of time with respect to the distances that have to be covered with respect to x. So if we go ahead and take the derivative of this, the derivative of time with respect to the quantity x, that's going to be equal to, uh, I'm going to factor a one third out from this first term. And now I need the derivative of this root. Now to take the derivative of this root, you're going to want to recognize that the root is really a power, and it's a one-half power. So we can go ahead and we can multiply by the one-half, subtract one from the one-half, and then we're going to have the same inner function here. So what I'm really using here is I'm using a little chain rule. And then I'm going to have to multiply that by the derivative of this inner function, the derivative of what you see with inside, inside the set of grouping symbols here. The derivative of 4 is 0. Now the derivative of this is going to require another little chain rule. So I'm going to multiply by this exponent, subtract 1 from it. I'm going to leave this inner function inside this quantity. And then I'm going to multiply by the derivative of this innermost function, and the derivative of 6 minus x is going to be negative 1. So this great big long line is just the derivative of the first term here. The derivative of the second term is much simpler if you recognize that this is 1 fifth times x. Uh, the derivative of 1 fifth times x is just going to be 1 fifth. And so what we want to do with this derivative is we want to figure out when it's equal to 0. We want to figure out when it's undefined. We want to find critical numbers. We need to know when our time function is going to be at a minimum value and that can only occur at critical numbers. So uh, if we simplify this a little bit, uh, let's see. I have this quantity that's raised to a negative power. I'm going to bump that back across the fraction bar into the denominator, change the sign on the exponent to a positive 1 half, and rather than writing it as a positive 1 half power, I'm going to change it back to a root. I have a 3 and a 2 in the denominator along with that root. But I have a 2 in the numerator. This stuff's going to stay up top, right? None of this has a negative power on it. So that 2 is going to cancel with this 2. So that's going to leave me with just a 3 as the coefficient of the root in the denominator. And then in the numerator, I'm just going to be left with uh, this set of parentheses times negative 1. I'm going to distribute negative 1 into that set of parentheses and get positive x. Right, negative x times negative 1, and then minus 6. So there's the first term, second term. No need to really touch it at all. Uh, what we can go ahead and think now is, okay, well, we have an x in the denominator, so we have to be a little concerned about our derivative being undefined. But if you think about this, no matter what you put in place of this x, you're, you're going to subtract s that number from 6, and then you're going to square that quantity. When you square a quantity, you get a positive answer. When you add a positive number to a positive answer, you're only going to have a positive number. There's no way that 4 plus a positive number is going to be equal to 0. So we don't have any places where our derivative is undefined. We do need to figure out if our derivative is ever going to be equal to 0. So if we set our derivative equal to 0, uh, this is going to be a little bit tedious to do without a calculator. Basically, what you'd have to do is subtract the, the 1 fifth from this side. Then you probably would want to multiply both sides by this denominator. You'd square both sides to get rid of the root, but then you'd have to square this x minus 6. You're going to have to FOIL that out. It's possible to go through all those algebraic steps. I'm going to take a little bit of a, a break here, get some stuff going on the calculator, and be back with you in just one minute. And so what I've done here is I've, in my calculator, I'm going to graph this and I'm going to figure out when that graph is equal to 0. Now I have manipulated my window settings a little bit. I changed x to range from 0 to 6 since we would expect the, the value to be uh, somewhere in between 0 and 6 since that's just going to be a total of 6 miles. Uh, and I also changed the, the y values from negative 10 to 10, min and max, to negative 1 and 1. And what we see is we see that this derivative is equal to 0 at that point. So if we go ahead into the calculate menu, use the 0 feature to find it. Left bound, that looks good. Need to go to the right of that point now to give my calculator a right bound. 
and then I need to give my calculator a guess to so just try to get close to that zero and we have a value of 4.5 and again you could have done this algebraically we to save a little bit of time chose to solve this graphically with the calculator we get the x value of 4.5 uh, is this going to indicate a location on our time function that is a minimum? Well, this is a graph of dt dx. This is a graph of the derivative of time. If we were trying to make a sign chart here, and we shouldn't let x go outside the range of 0 to 6, we see that the one time when this derivative is equal to 0 is 1.5. If we build a sign chart for our derivative, and we recognize that this is a graph of that derivative, right? I, I just graphed this. This is dt dx. That derivative is negative here, right? This graph is negative to the left of 4.5. So we have a negative value for dt dx to the left of 4.5. And then we have a positive value of uh, positive y values, positive derivative values on the right. So what this tells us is that our time is going to decrease as x ranges from 0 to 4.5, but then our time spent traveling is going to increase as we let x range from 4.5 to 6. And that does tell us that we have our minimum time achieved at the x value of 4.5. So we can go ahead and say x is going to be 4.5 to minimize time, meaning row the boat to a location on the shoreline that leaves you 4.5 miles to travel on land the rest of the way to the house. Uh, so we've answered the, the last question. It does say find the least amount of time required to reach the house. Well, all you'd have to do to, to figure that out is take this time function, put 4.5 in place of that x, put 4.5 in place of that x, evaluate it. You have your minimum time. I'm going to toss this into the calculator quick, real quick. We'll look at that answer, and then we'll wrap. And so all I did was what I described before I paused the video there. I tossed 4.5 in place of this x, in place of this x, evaluated it on the calculator. The minimum time is going to be uh, about 1.733 hours. That's going to be measured in hours. That's what time was measured by uh, within these rates here. And then x is 4.5 miles. So there you go.